Okay? <laughs> I like to be busy. We've got a few things about evangelism that we do want to talk about. First of all, before we get started, I want to show you one of these. This is a brochure I'm going to bombard you with this time and time and time and time again until you get it through your head. This is your ammunition you're going to use to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ and to infuse them for Jesus Christ if they already know Him. So this is a brochure I made up for you to use as ammunition to bring people to Jesus Christ. And I want you to use it. I'm going to put it in your hand. I'll be to your home. I haven't been there yet, but I'll get there. And so have a pot of coffee ready for me, and we'll talk turkey about evangelism, okay? This is a card that goes along with it. Uh, God, Christ, and the Bible. Use it in conjunction with it. It's your talking point. And on the back of this, we have the little chapel here that we have, and Rich is going to get a colored picture of this on the back, and I think it'll be a lot better. This is more ammunition for you to use in the coming days for the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? <clears throat> a little levity, though, goes a long, long way, doesn't it? The White Witch of Africa, she was known as, uh, because of the great things that she did in Africa. I mean, she did some wonderful, wonderful things. Not miraculous, but just expended herself into the lives and hearts and lives of other people. And because of that, they called her the White Witch of Africa. She came to the United States. They honored her with a great dinner. And she sat there, and one person talk, uh, approached her and said this to her. He said, well, uh, he was being very indignant, being very, uh, trying to catch her off guard, I guess. And he said to her, uh, do you think the devil is important? And she thought for a minute, and she said, well, he must be. And then pointedly said, a lot of people talk about him, don't they? And she got the point. He went on further and said to her, he said, uh, well, you don't find, you find good in everybody, don't you? Huh? Trying to catch her up. You found good and find good in everybody. You don't talk negatively about anybody, do you? And uh, she said, well, I try not to. And he said, do you find any good in the devil? And she turned around and looked him in the eye and said, well, he's very industrious, isn't he? And he got the point. He got the point. You've heard that before, but I did want to tell that to you again. What's really important in life to you? Answer the question to your own satisfaction. What is really important in life to you? Uh, think about it, if you would, for a, a bit. A lot of people think in terms of, <clears throat> I've got to look at that clock, I've got to keep it in my head. A lot of people think in terms of life's journey as an important thing. They're born as children. You've heard me say this before. They grow up. They... and. Uh, they say repetition is the greatest teacher, so you're going to get a lot of repetition from me this morning, okay? <laughs> so they grow up, and they go, they go through school, and they graduate, and they go on to college, they go into the military, they get married, they get a job, whatever the case may be. They grow to manhood, they have a wonderful wife, they have uh, seven good kids like I've got, and maybe uh, two or three good kids, I don't know. But a number of children, and they have a good job, they have a two cars in, in the shop, and or, most of the time, because when you have two cars, they're in the shop most of the time. But in the driveway, they have them. And uh, not only that, but uh, they go on vacation every year. They get along with their association, their friends, and neighbors, and such as that. They do a lot of good in the community, don't they? And this is what happens when people grow up in life's journey. This is uh, what Americans accept. That's what we accept as Christians, as being important to us in life. But is it really important? Well, yes it is. In sustaining us, getting us along, helping us in this physical life we live and so on, and meeting our wants and needs and desires, right? Absolutely right. And so we find ourselves on this journey of life as something of great importance. A lot of people believe that one of the greatest things in life is a financial goal. Gaining financially, getting security, getting all the things they need. Wow, this is really important. And a lot of people go so far as to, uh, like J. Paul Getty, you've heard me talk about him before. Uh, like, uh, what are some of the other guys in Warren America Buffett. that are so wealthy? Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. Yeah, some of these guys, you see. The, they, uh, money is very, very important to them. Uh, and it should be, to, in some respect. But not when it's a goal. Not when it's something that you really seek after and want in life. But it becomes very, very important to you. Remember, now it's important. You've got to have it. We had to have money for this facility. God provided it, right? God provided it. There we go. So you have to have money for things, but not as a goal, you see. A lot of people like to have a free spirit. Uh, they like to see the world. I, I did try that. 
They like to try everything. I even tried that, but it didn't work. You know, I'm, I'm still trying to see, do everything. And uh, yeah, I'm reminded of the Army to be all you can be in life. That's what a lot of people think. That to them is important. Try everything. Be everything. Go everything. Uh, just do everything you possibly can in life because after all, you only live once. That's the phrase that people use. You only live once. So it's important to them. An occurrence took place in a, a, a city in uh, northern Indiana where we started a new church some years ago where they said we couldn't do it, but we did it anyway. And we met in the basement of a house. And we had about a number of seats down there. I think in about six months we were running about 50 people. And during Sunday school hour or the uh, study hour, we discussed various things uh, uh, of the Christian life. And this morning we were just discussing uh, how to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. What's really important to live for the Lord Jesus Christ? We broke up into different groups and so on. And as we were talking, I noticed this individual friend of mine was sitting there very quietly. Very wealthy young man. His father owned a large asphalt company in northern Michigan, southern Indiana, northern Indiana, northern Indiana. Northern Ohio, I'll get it straight yet, Southern Michigan, those three areas, the tri-state area. Very, very successful. And if I mentioned him, some of you probably would know. But anyway, very wealthy, and he, uh, uh, he had a lot going for him. And he was very quiet during our discussion. But we got around to him and I asked him the question, I said, what do you think about this business of living our lives for Jesus Christ? Uh, uh, what is important in Christianity, do you think, to you? And he thought about that, and he looked down, and he looked up, he said, well, I want to know something else. I said, okay. He said, um, how far can I go? What can I do? What's really important for me to do? How far can I? I said, well, how far can you go? What are you talking about, how far you can go? He said, well, you know, I live in this life here, and I'm a Christian, but I want to know how far I can go and what I can do so that I can be in right standing with God and not be in jeopardy. What he meant was this. He drew a line, an imaginary line. And the world was over here, and Christianity was over here. He loved the things of the world because he had a lot of goods, a lot of things. But he wanted to be right with God at the same time, so he stepped into the kingdom of God as well and became, we thought, born again. He wanted both of these things. How far can I go in the world and still maintain myself in Christianity? I said, that's not the issue. That's not the point. The point is it was like an umbrella. Once you accept Christ, it's 100%. Not 50%, it's 100% and it engulfs the sum total of your life. Your associations become greater. Not only your associations become greater, but your children become greater, your wife becomes greater. All the things that you do in life, these become important to you because of Jesus Christ. You approach them with a different perspective, you see. So Jesus is 100% in your life. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Well, yeah, I guess I do. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, it didn't make much of an impression on him because uh, uh, later on he didn't come to church, okay? And uh, he kind of disappeared into the woodwork, so to speak, but we knew he was out there. And we saw him once in a while. So what's really important? What's really important in life to individuals? In Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter and the 13th verse, it says this, that the sum total of the thing is to fear God, that is to respect God, right? What do we got here? Somebody talking? Okay. is to fear God or respect God, and at the same time, then on respecting Him, to obey His commands. And this is the total duty of man. This is the sum duty of man. To, to fear God, to respect Him. Remember this now. To respect God and obey His commands. The sum total or duty of man. Now, in the light of that, this encompasses your whole life. But I want you to think in terms of one channel, and that's in evangelism. So if we said this, we said if we say it like this, to fear God where evangelism is concerned, and obey God in evangelism where it's concerned, that's the duty of the Christian. Okay? That's the duty of the Christian. Whoa, now, wait a minute. Hold on. Isn't that the duty of the preacher? Huh? Isn't that the duty of those in charge of evangelism and so on? No, it's the duty of all of us. Every one of us that are in the kingdom of God, that is our duty. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. And the second is like unto the first, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the duty of the Christian. You do that by bringing them to Jesus Christ. That's what you do. And uh, what a wonderful verse. And Jesus says, there are no two greater commandments than this. If you love Jesus, you're going to love your neighbor. That's all there is to it. 
Okay, so what's really important, how important is our life really in the sight of God concerning the things that He wants us to do? How important is it in the sight of God, now remember that, as to what He wants us to do? What is His perspective? Well, I'll give you His perspective, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll give it to you short and sweet. He sent His Son here to show how important it was for Him to want us to do His work and to live for Him and fulfill the whole duty of man here on earth. He sent His Son here to earth. Now, Jesus was born of a natural persuasion, right? Okay? Born of a woman. Born of a virgin. Made, born during the time of law. We find that in Galatians, the fourth chapter, right? Born in a natural sense, except the Holy Spirit entered into the picture. He's the one that impregnated her. That was God doing this, and as a result, she became pregnant. And so he was born in a natural way. He grew up in a natural way. When he grew up to the age of about 30, he had about a three and a half year ministry on this earth. I'm trying to get along here to keep this time in. About a three and a half year ministry here on this earth, right? And he spoke, brought the good news of God because of that. But that was, that was what he came for. That was his ministry. But he had a mission that was much higher than this. And that mission was going to the cross of Calvary to be a sacrificial lamb. Behold the Lamb of God, John said. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When he saw Jesus, when he came to the River Jordan to be immersed by John the Baptist. And so he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That was his mission. Uh, he counted it not Robert to be equal with God, didn't he? Huh? He counted it not Robert, but became still obedient because he was in the flesh, became obedient as a son, became obedient even unto the cross. So that was his mission here on this earth, to go and become that sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world, ladies and gentlemen. Died, buried in a borrowed tomb, rose again on the third day, spent some time here on the earth before he ascended back into heaven, didn't he? Now, the Bible shows us 11 different times that he appeared on the earth, but I believe he appeared more times than that. I'm quite sure he did. Uh, John says of all the things that he did on this earth, and I have to think in terms of all the times that he showed himself to people too, of all the things he did on here, John says, that if I were able to record them, even the books of the world would not hold it. See? So I think Jesus appeared more times than just 11 times uh, here on this earth. Now, before his ascension, the... Uh, Think it's this. Jesus understood the whole duty of man. He was in the flesh. Right? Well, God man, but in the flesh. And he understood the whole duty of man because of that fact. In terms of, and remember, we're talking in terms of evangelism now. Okay, but the sum duty of the whole duty of man it encompasses everything. But he understood this. This was very important. The word important is something you need to grasp a hold of and make it part of your life. The word important. Jesus now, secondly, commissioned the early church to carry out His message to the known world at that time. He commissioned the church, right? Let's look at Matthew, the 28th chapter. Very familiar. You know, repetition is the greatest teacher and you're going to hear the things over and over and over and over again until you're sick of them. But you're going to hear them until they get into your heart, in your mind, into your head, and it's going to become part of you and you're going to rejoice in them. Now in the 28th chapter in the 19th and 20th verses you'll find in the book of Matthew, it says this, Jesus now, remember, has taken His group out to, into Galilee where He's going to send into heaven, Right? And so here he is, and he's speaking for the very last time. What would you say if you had the last words to say to your followers or those you really care about? What would be the last words you would say? Huh? Well, they must be very important if they're the last words, right? And so Jesus stood up and said this. Now listen, here's my last words to you. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, or make disciples of all nations, depending on what version you're looking at. But preach the gospel to every creature and baptize them or immerse them. The word baptize was never used in 1611, so we're going to use the word immerse them in the name of in God, in the name of Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. How do you say that? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and baptize them in the name of the Father. Now we got it. And the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Remember, this is Jesus saying this. I have commanded you, and don't worry, you guys. 
I'm going to be with you even unto the end of the world. How's He going to be with him? He just ascended into heaven. He's on His way up to heaven. A cloud disappeared out of sight. He's gone. How's He going to be with him? Ah, John, the Gospel of John, He says, listen, I'm leaving, guys. But I'm going to send someone to take my place. I'm going to send a comforter. It's the Holy Spirit of God. And that is me with you. And through that, I am going to guide you in all truth. This is what He says. So He told us... He told them what He wanted them to do. In Acts, the first chapter, you'll find this in Luke, you'll find this in Mark, this is a great commission. You'll find it in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, it says, starting first at Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth that He wants us to go. Everywhere to take the gospel of Jesus Christ, He says. And they started spreading, they started growing. Acts, the eighth chapter, remember, through persecution. John himself, or uh, Paul, Saul, we'll get him straightened out in a minute. Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, was wreaking havoc with the church at this time. Uh, a lot of things were happening. He was taking your brethren and leading them away, leading them away in chains, tied up, and, and putting them in prison. And I believe Jim probably killed a lot of them at the same time. I believe that very firmly. And uh, uh, that he reflected on those things in later years. But at any rate... This was the Apostle Paul, who was now Saul doing these things. And it said because of the persecution that started there in Jerusalem, that the brethren went everywhere that were scattered abroad, teaching what? What were they teaching? Anybody know? Teaching about Jesus as the Son of God and Savior of the world. Men, women, and children, Jeff. Men, women, and children. No preacher involved here saying, hey, I'm standing up in front of you and speaking great flowery words. No, but not him. But everybody went everywhere preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And they did this for about 300 years. They couldn't build a church because they were under persecution. Ten of the greatest persecutions the church ever affected, ever received was in the first 300 years of the church. So there was no buildings. No buildings at all. No reference point like this. The reference point was Jesus. That's the reference point. That's what who they had to take out to the known world in order that they might get the message of Jesus Christ. So for 300 years they did this. You know what happened? They finally won over the Roman Empire and became the state religion of the Roman Empire by 323 A.D. Can you imagine? No church reference. No buildings. Just Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the message they took. Was that enough? Absolutely that was enough and history bears that out to us. So his followers understood the importance of the whole duty of man, not only in their lives, but where evangelism was concerned. They understood what they had to do. And they just simply did it. That's all. And that's all it takes. Just get up and do it. Someone said, well, that's really hard to do. Well, yeah, it is. But so is going to work every morning. I hate going to work. I used to just despise it. And it's tough getting up to get that first cup of coffee. You stagger to the counter, get that cup of coffee, and find a seat somewhere and flop down. And, oh, it's hard at first, but after what comes refreshing. After you have that first sip, oh, it's great. It's great stuff. Okay, but the initial step is really hard. But that's our job we have to do. So they understood the importance of this. Thirdly, he has commissioned us to carry this message to our world today. We have a facility. I mentioned this already. We have a facility here, and it's coming along beautifully, and I'm amazed at what God does through His, uh, how shall I say, stumbling, falling over people, because that's what we are. We just stumble along and do the best we can. We find ourselves doing things over and over and over and over again, and finally we get the job done and say, wow, I'm amazed at God, but I'm not amazed at me because I've stumbled all over the thing. You know, you know how it goes. You know what I'm talking about. But we have a facility here, and a lot of people say this. They say, well, build it, and they will come. No! They won't come. Now, Sharon came. Okay? We're thankful for you. We really are. Now, you did. You found us, right? Okay, so once in a while it happens. But by and large, they don't come, ladies and gentlemen. So, well, what are, what are we building this facility for? A reference point to go out from. Sharing together the things of the Lord so that we can be together in this work of evangelism for Jesus Christ. That's why we have a reference center. Can you understand that? Yes. Get it in our minds. Get it in our crawl. This is not what it's all about. This is just a building. From here we take Jesus out. 
That's what's important. So don't think in terms of building it, and they will come. In Matthew, the ninth chapter, the 13th verse, Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In Acts, the 17th chapter, the 30, 30, 30th verse, I'll get it straight in a minute. In the times of people's ignorance, God winked at, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. What do we mean repent? We mean turn about and go in the opposite direction. That's what we're talking about. Not your way, not yourself, but God. Turn around and go that way toward God. Not that way toward yourself. That's exactly what repentance means. Okay? So now He commands all men everywhere to repent. And He says if you don't repent, Jesus says, now in Luke the 13th chapter, the 13th and 3rd verse, if you don't repent, you shall all likewise perish. Wow, that's a sobering thought. Can you imagine, if I don't turn around and go toward God, and, and continue toward myself, I'm going to perish. I have no hope. There is no heaven. There is no Jesus. There's nothing. Unless I'm willing to repent. And go in the opposite direction. Amazing. Does the church need this message? <laughs> Absolutely the church needs this message. It needs to get turned around and headed in the right direction. Because in many places I find that not to be a valid fact. You think I like to say that? No! I want to see my church turned on. I want to see people everywhere turned on for Jesus Christ so He can go out into our society and bring the world to Jesus. That's what I want to see. Glory. And I hope and think you think the very same way. Luke, the 14th chapter, 23rd verse says, Jesus said, go out into the highways, not build it, they shall come, but go on out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. Persuade them to come in. Give them the message of Jesus where they can come in. Come into what? The kingdom of God. Not this church building. The kingdom of God is what he's talking about. If he's talking about a church building, you know, it's like, it's like St. Peter at the Golden Gate and a lot of people got a bunch of ropes on a church building and they're dragging it toward those pearly gates and Peter said, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're bringing it, we're getting it here, we're getting the church there. Guys, this is not what it's about, he says. It's about you taking people out, going out into the world and building the church, which are people. Where's the people behind that building? I don't see them. They just didn't understand Nice little story. John, the fourth chapter, the 35th verse, Jesus says this, and I love these words. Look now, look out, because the fields are now white unto harvest. They are ripe. They are ripe and ready right now. Now, someone says, wait a minute, weren't they 50 years ago a lot riper? No, they're riper now. Because every generation that lives, every, every, when you're living right now in this day and age, it's ripe to you. It's very ripe, and it's been 2,000 years. So it's getting riper and riper and riper and better, ladies and gentlemen. So there's no time in world history that's any better than right now to bring souls to the kingdom of God. No better time in world history. It's ripe now more so than it's ever been throughout our history, ladies and gentlemen. So does the church really understand this, though? Does the church know this and realize the importance of this whole duty of man concerning evangelism in 2012 now. Do they? I don't know. I don't know, but I know a few people do. And that's enough for me. And with that few people, we're going to gain a multitude of people in the lake and build this congregation into a mighty fortress. Absolutely. Size and the amount of people is not to mean a mighty fortress. But what's in their heart and minds and what they do and what they think and where they go and what they, what they care, how they carry them on. Do they look upon people, upon you, and see Jesus in you? That's the mighty fortress. You understand that? That is the mighty fortress. Wow, that person belongs to Christ. I want to be part of that because of the way they live. That's what I want. Absolutely. And a couple with that, you can stand up and say, but let me tell you who makes that possible. It's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Not me. He's done it all. That's the message we take. So, But does the church understand this? Does the church realize the importance of this? What's the message we ought to take out? And this is what I want to get over to your crawl. Because a lot of people are so misinformed. 
about the message of God being able to get the type of message, the message that you have to preach to God. I want you to take you back to the... we got time, so I'm going to take you back to the second chapter of the book of Acts. And I want you to listen real close. First gospel sermon that's ever preached. This is the message that you have to take out. This is the first gospel sermon that's ever preached on the face of the earth, ladies and gentlemen. The Apostle Peter is standing up and he tells about the prophets, telling about Jesus Christ. Then he gets to David. Let me get my cheaters on here so I can read a little bit, okay? So then he gets to David. And he talks about him. And he says about David, he says, uh, second chapter of the book of Acts, I'll get there in a minute, I'm clear over in, in Psalm. Now that's not it, is it? Okay. So we get into the second chapter of the book of Acts here, and he talks about the prophets. Now he talks about David, and David spoke concerning him, for I, said, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he's on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my tongue rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, all my, uh, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer the Holy One to see corruption. And on and on he goes. He's talking about David, talking about Jesus Christ, Many years before Jesus came to this earth, talking about the Son of God, that's what he's saying. And down here, as he said, uh, in the 29th verse, he says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us to this day, therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise Christ up to sit on his throne. Wow! God created the throne of David as a permanent fixture for the Jesus Christ to sit on it. Is that powerful or is that not? That is beautiful. And he goes on to say, he goes on to say, see he, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell either. Neither would his flesh see corruption, that Jesus hath God, this Jesus, God has raised up, wherefore we are witnesses of this. We are witnesses of the therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, having received the Father of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, He has shed forth this which you now see. You're looking upon me, listening to me talk. You're seeing wonders and things going on. Seventeen principal nations hearing my message all at the same time, but in different dialects. You're seeing the working of the Holy Spirit here right now that David spoke about all of these things. For David has not ascended to the heavens, but he hath himself... The Lord, he has said this, that the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. God said this to Jesus Christ long before Jesus Christ came to the earth, he is saying. Okay? I'm going to make them your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know, most assuredly, that God hath made Jesus Christ both Lord and Messiah because of all of this. Raised him from the dead, obedient son, God hath made Jesus both Lord and Messiah. Wow! And when they heard this, these people, all of these Jews, there was over 2 million Jews there probably in Jerusalem at that time and the surrounding city. And when they heard this message, many of them responded, listen, and they said this, you've heard this many times, but I'm going to tell you again. And they said this, they said, wow, men and brethren, what must we do? They accepted Christ. You realize that? These 3,000 people accepted Jesus Christ in that moment. That's important for you to know. Were they saved at that time when they accepted Jesus? Were they saved in that moment? Then why did Peter say that? Here's what you've got to do because they said, men and brethren, what are we going to do? What can we kill the Lord of glory? What can we do to, to salvage our souls and get rid of this great sin that we committed? And here's what he said to them. Repent. Turn around and go in the opposite direction. Don't go by yourself. Repent of the sin that you've done. Repent and be immersed be immersed in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, and then you'll receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit. Can you imagine the affront of Peter saying that to these people like that? What business did he have of saying that to them? Because he had the message of God. That's why he said it. And he said, repent and be immersed. Immersed into what? Be immersed into water. Philip and the eunuch that were going down the road in the Gaza Strip, and they looked down and he said, and the Ethiopian eunuch said, Here's water. Here's some water. What, does consider, what, what hinders me to be immersed? Only that you believe, said Philip. And they stepped down into the water and he immersed him into the water. They came up out of the water and Philip was caught away with the Lord to Samaria. 
And the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way, rejoicing, born again, new life in Christ, you see. Because he was immersed, he followed after the Lord Jesus. Is there something in that water that's magical? No! No, there isn't. Well, the ark was preparing when it was finalized. It says in 1 Peter, it says that the water raised it up, ladies and gentlemen. Raised it up. And eight souls were saved by water, Jeff. Eight souls were saved by water. Where unto the like figure of immersion does also now save us. But not the washing of the filth of the flesh. The answer of a good conscience. Poor God. Knowing you're doing the right thing, Scott. That's what that means. Knowing that you obey God. That's what that means. From the heart. When Juan and I came to Christ, it was the most glorious day of our life. Because we knew that we were obeying Christ. And we were immersed into Jesus Christ. You don't believe that? Take a look at Romans, the first seven verses of the seventh chapter. First seven verses of the seventh chapter and see what it means to be immersed into Christ. Galatians says when we are immersed, we are immersed into Christ. That's what it says. You're not immersed in that tank. You're not immersed in what? You're immersed into Christ. And like as Christ was raised up from the glory of the dead, even so we are raised up to walk in newness of life as well. You understand what I'm saying? That's the message you've got to take to people. That's what it's all about. How wonderful is that? I think it's great, ladies and gentlemen. And here's the important thing. You cannot receive the Holy Spirit according to the Word of God until you have been immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Wow, wait a minute, hold on. What do you mean? Immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Don't look at me, I'm not. I'm just telling you what He says. You want to, you want to take it up with somebody? Take it up with God. Don't take it up with me. That's what He says. That's what I'm telling you right now. You can't receive the Holy Spirit until you've been immersed into Christ and your sins are taken away. The Holy Spirit cannot abide with sin. He can only abide with righteousness. So He can step into your life. Stand up here a minute, Jeff. Take a look at Jeff. What do you see here, ladies and gentlemen? Turn around here. What do you see here? Tell me what you see there. Huh? Do you see Jeff? Do you see Jeff? No, you don't. No, you don't. You see what He represents. He's inside here. The real Him is inside of Him. This is His tabernacle. This is the house that He lives in. And here's what happens, Jeff. Once you have been immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of sin, then the Holy Spirit said, Wow, I'm coming into a righteous body. And in He comes. And He says to you, He said, Hi, Jeff. How you doing, buddy? I've been a long time waiting to get in. And we're going to have a great journey together, you and I. There's two of you living in here. Sit down. There's two of you living in there. And that's what it's all about. You understand what I'm saying? There's two inside of Him. He's living a righteous life now because the Holy Spirit of God can abide with Him because sin has been taken away. Amen. And it can only be done if you obey God through Jesus Christ according to the Scripture. Glory. Don't give me your ideas. Don't tell me your fantasies. Don't tell me your, your idiosyncrasies. I want to know the Scripture. That's what it's about. And until you get that in your head, you don't have a message to carry to God. You have only a self-message. You have only a, a made-up message. You have a message that denominational takes out. You have a message that you've been told is right. But it's not right. It's according to the Scripture, ladies and gentlemen. And that's where it's at. And you've got to get that into your crawl. Well, we could go on and on and on. But the time is slipping by. And I want to come to a conclusion. Wow, he's coming to a conclusion. Praise the Lord God. Okay. So, we have a tremendous opportunity here, ladies and gentlemen. In Polk County, we once had four Christian churches. No, ten. Ten? And in Lakewood, we had four. Yeah. Okay. We had ten in Lakewood. Now, there's many great churches in Lakewood. Many great people in Lakewood. Many born-again people in Lakewood. People that you wouldn't even dream as being born again, but they are because of their associations. That's right. Wow, now wait a minute. Is that blasphemy? Come on, boy. Morty, what are you talking about? There are people that are Christian that you don't even dream as being Christian, ladies and gentlemen, because they have obeyed Jesus Christ as the Lord. They have obeyed, listen to that, obeyed Jesus Christ as the Lord. Not their denomination, but Jesus they have obeyed. And that's what it's about. But we have four Christian churches here at one time. 
Okay? Now there's two. There was one. And that one, I'm not going to go there. There was one. Now we have two. And I believe that Northside Christian Church has an opportunity like no other right now. We're making a great impact upon a lot of people around Polk County. Not only Polk County, but in different parts of the state and going around the world, right? Right. Okay? And so we're making a great impact right now. But we have only begun to fight. We have only begun this work of Jesus Christ here in Lakeland. We now have the opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to help our sister churches get it right. The only reason that they did not grow, they don't exist, is because they refused to practice one-on-one -on -one evangelism with Jesus Christ. That's why. Wow, Morty, you're severe. Absolutely I'm severe. Because that's where it's at. Me looking you straight in the eye and say, you need Jesus. I want to talk to you about Jesus. Not quite like that. She's a little subtlety, obviously. And I've got some material I want to put into your hands. Okay? Let me come to your home. Let's sit down and have a cup of coffee together. Hey, how about coming to dinner, Richard? I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ. Okay? It works. All right. So we've just begun to fight. And we can go into our sister churches and introduce some things and talk to the elders, talk to some people there, and say, hey, we want to help you. We've got some things that are beneficial for you to help you grow and learn the things of God. Let us help you. <coughs> and we can do that. We can make changes like you never dreamed possible. I don't know what God has for us in the future. I have no idea. But it's great, whatever it is, because God is right square in the middle of it. Today is the day, ladies and gentlemen, of commitment right where you sit. A day of commitment. Listen to that. It's important. That's what's important in life. Carry the message through commitment to Jesus. So today is a day of commitment for you. All of us here need to commit ourselves to this work of evangelism, to this work that needs to be done for Northside Christian Church to grow. Number one, if you have never, and I mean this sir, sincerely, if you have never committed to the message of Jesus Christ, if you have not been immersed in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, you can do that today. If you have a need, whatever that need may be, Jesus can handle it today. He can. So we've got commitment. Maybe you've never put Christ in your life. And if you've got a need, we're going to pray for that too. We're going to do all we can do to make things better for one another here today. Okay? And if you don't have a church home, I'm looking you straight in the eye and telling you right now you've got one here. You need to come here. You need to be here because we're going to do great things. Not us but Jesus Christ through us. You're nothing, Richard. You're just a vessel for God. That's all you are, George. You're just a, a piece of clay to be molded by the potter. That's all. Jim, you amount to a hill of beans. But Jesus is everything to you. Amen. We are nothing, ladies and gentlemen. And He is everything. And with that in mind, I thank you in the name of Jesus. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. I want the praise team to come forward. We're going to sing an invitation song. Glenn, 